I plan on today's video being pretty long. There's a lot of stuff that I want to talk about, so pull up a chair, pop some popcorn, pour a glass of Coca-Cola, and listen to my story as a TCG player who's never competitively played Duel Links on how I got to King of Games in just a handful of days playing a deck that most would consider rogue at best, a deck that used to be very good, but one that at the moment, at least in my um, run to King of Games, I didn't really play against a lot of mirror match. Matches because I have a ton of things to say about Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links both as a game and in comparison to the TCG and I want to cover all of that in this video so without further ado let's jump right in. I've mentioned before that I've quit Duel Links and I wanted to talk about briefly why I bothered to even do this. Why Duel Links and why now? Well, one reason is that it is currently the off season of the TCG. It's after the WCQ and before regionals start up, so I didn't really have anything else to do. And then the other reason, and probably the bigger reason, is that the Hearthstone metagame is really stale right now. And currently, the at the time of this video being recorded, there's a new set getting released in about a week. So there's like a two week period where there's nothing interesting happening in the metagame and I kind of just wanted a game to play on my phone. So because it's the off season of the TCG and because Hearthstone isn't that interesting right now, I wanted something to do on live streams and I decided that I would pick up Duel Links again. Now if you watch that video that I posted where I got to gold in just a couple hours, which I now realize is kind of laughable, but uh, I played with Dinosaurs, which is the deck that I played a year ago, way back in 2017 when the game sort of was in its infancy and I played this dinosaur deck that really just was full of 1900 beaters and at the time I thought getting to gold was pretty good but like I said looking back on it getting to gold is not very hard however I did really find it difficult to actually climb out of gold once I got there with dinosaurs I actually played another live stream and I think we went like two and seven with dinosaurs it simply was too difficult even with uh, playable cards like enemy controller and cards like gem merchant which were pretty useful through Rookie and Silver, cards like that just weren't good enough against gold opponents, and uh, I would eventually realize that the metagame got a lot harder once you got to Legend, obviously, but I think the gold uh, rank really was the first time that I realized, okay, if I want to climb any higher than this, especially just to Platinum, I'm going to have to play a different deck. That brings me to my next point, which is how did I decide on a deck to play? So I did end up doing this with Spellbooks. I'll throw the deck list up on the screen in a second, but the reason that I decided to play Spellbooks wasn't because I believed that Spellbooks as a deck would be the best strategy. However, I looked at the Duel Links card pool and I asked myself, what is the best possible card that I can play? Not like the whole deck, but what's the best singular card that I can play? Because if there's a best singular card, especially if it's good against Amazonas and Fur Hires, which are the most of the metagame right now, what is it and how can I take advantage of it? And I really did think, and I still think that Spellbook of Fate is actually the best single card in the Duel Links card pool. There are certainly good cards in the Fur Hires strategy, but I think the reason Fur Hires are good don't, doesn't really have to do with any singular card, but rather just the ad advancement of the strategy itself compared to a lot of the other Duel Links decks out there. And the reason Amazonists are good, obviously Amazonist Queen and Amazonist Onslaught are really powerful cards, but I think it's the whole deck. But Spellbook of Fate has something that most Duel Links cards do not have, and that is that it is a flexible and searchable out to pretty much any card in the game and that's something that we don't find in Duel Links a lot. It pretty much was in some ways the extra deck of my strategy. There really isn't a lot of extra deck cards in Duel Links besides just fusion monsters. There aren't cards like uh, Castell to out problematic cards. So cards like Spellbook of Fate are extremely good because I can search them whenever I need them and then I can out a variety of board states and it was good when you were ahead, it was good when you were behind it was good anywhere in between, which meant that I really wanted to play whatever deck had Spellbook of Fate. As for the decklist itself, I didn't want to play the 30 card Grasslux Greener version. Not only did I feel it was too expensive for what I was trying to do, but also I felt that it was way too inconsistent with the recent nerf on the restart skill. So I went with the 20 card Silent Magician build and there weren't really any changes that I made all the way from gold up to King of Games. There's actually only one change and that was cutting the third copy 
of Spellbook of Master for the one copy of Spellbook Organization. And that card isn't that good in the TCG. However, in dueling specifically, it is actually crucial to this deck. And I think if I never would have added that card, I likely never would have made it to King of Games. The reason the card is so crucial, and I'll talk about this in a second, but you need to have three spell books in your grave on turn one against fur hires if you ever want a hope of beating that matchup. But there aren't a lot of great cards that actually let you get three cards in the grave. And what I was finding myself doing a lot was just adding spell book of power just to activate it turn one just to get it in the graveyard. That sort of wastes the power though. Obviously you can add it back, but if you're just going to add something to throw it in the graveyard anyway, it might as well be spell book organization to give you a chance to stack your deck. And actually the card came in handy a lot. In a lot of cases it helped me stack Silent Magician to the top of my deck. Now as far as is the game free to play or is the game pay to win, I didn't want to spend any time grinding. I just wanted to build the deck immediately. And what I did with that is that I spent about $150 to build the stack. You have to buy three structure decks to get the sound additions, and then I had to buy some packs to get the actual spellbook cards. The tricky part there is that both Spellbooks of Secret and Spellbook Magician of Prophecy are super rares, and in the two boxes that I opened, the first two, Spellbook of Secrets was actually on the very, very bottom of the 80 card pile, which meant that I had to spend quite a lot more than I think I would have had to normally if I built a different deck, because I believe Fur Hires only have one super rare card. I think it's just Beat, which means that you don't have to spend as much money to build those strategies, but that's about as much as I spent. I think in general, this game isn't necessarily pay to win. I think it's more of a pay to play. But there were some cards that I simply did not have access to. Cards like Cosmic Cycle and cards like Wall of Disruption. Ultra rare cards from main sets are pretty much impossible to get if you don't want to spend literally hundreds of dollars, which meant that I could not play those cards even though Cosmic Cyclone would have comboed pretty well with my skill of choice, which was Switcheroo, a skill that I chose not only because it was all I had left because I didn't have restart because I didn't feel like grinding to get any new skills, but also it was a good skill to use with Sound Edition level 8 to put it back in the deck and draw a better card because pretty much every card in the deck is playable besides Silent Magician level 8 which meant that Switcheroo almost always other than the few times that I actually drew another copy of level 8 almost all the time it was going to draw me a really good card. If you're a Duel Links player and you're interested in playing spellbooks I think it is worth mentioning how the deck fares against the different metagame matchups that you're expected to play against right now. So I mentioned Fur Hires already but basically what you're trying to do every single turn one that you go first is get a spellbook of fate with three spellbooks in grave and that's pretty consistent you'll open um, a playable hand about 80% of the time someone did the math all you really have to draw is either blue boy or secrets and there's a 20 card deck so you have a really high chance of seeing either of those cards or both of those cards and that makes the deck fairly consistent for a lot of games because I felt that it was important to play a consistent deck especially on the grind from legend 3 to king of games where you have to win five games in a row which was pretty dang hard but against for hires if you go first you only almost always win. Going second, you will lose if they summon the um, card that negates stuff, the Wiz card. That card is almost impossible to out for a spellbook deck, but in a lot of the games that I played, my opponent actually didn't open that, and I will say that against that strategy, going first or second, Silent Magician is key to negate not only enemy controller, but also their revival spell for higher mayhem or whatever it's called. Now against Amazonas, it's pretty much an auto win. I think I only lost against two Amazonas, and one of them was a disconnect, which was super disappointing um, but pretty much Amazonas are only good because of Amazonas Onslaught which is an incredibly powerful card however you can just use Spellbook of Fate to banish it against Destiny Heroes it's really easy as well you just hold the fate until they activate mask change and then banish the monster that they're targeting it gets rid of two of their cards for one of yours it's a really good power play and I won most of those matchups um, against the mirror match I only ever played against the 30 card version I won every single time um, that deck just is not good for the Spellbook mirror match it plays very differently it's a lot less consistent and pretty much they would just summon Fool of Prophecy and I would fade it and then they would just lose immediately. Um, as far as the rogue matchups go, which I did play a lot of, especially in Platinum, Fate just beats everything, and Sound Magician beats most of the generic cards that people play, like Econ and like Cosmic Cyclone. So in general, you don't really have to worry about rogue decks. I did lose some games to them, simply because I was unfamiliar with how they worked, but once I played against them one or two times, figured out how they worked, I was able to pretty much beat a rogue deck every single time that I played against it. Even though I've hyped up the Spellbook deck a lot up until this point, and I do think it's a great choice, I do not think it's the best deck, and there definitely are some issues. So the first issue is, like I said, 
said, you have an 80% chance of opening either Secrets or Blue Boy. That number increases when you go second. That's obviously a really good number, but that 20%, you're pretty much going to lose every single time. You'll just draw hands that are like Fate, Eternity, Silent Magician, Silent Magician, and then draw into Power. Those hands are virtually unplayable. Now, with the Switcheroo skill, you actually can, if you don't get OTK'd, you can swap out one card from your hand, hopefully draw into Secrets or Blue Boy, but there certainly were games. I'm not going to pretend that there weren't games that I just bricked even with Switcheroo and just lost immediately. And that definitely sucks, but it's not a huge way around that. You can play some other starter cards I'll talk about in a little bit, but in general, I felt my deck was as consistent as I could possibly make it without sacrificing too much longevity. Also, I found a huge issue is that when you don't draw Silent Magician, it's actually really hard to kill your opponent. You have about four to six, maybe seven if you really push it and don't always banish three cards. You have that many fate activations per game. So a lot of times you would uh, really grind your opponent down to just a couple cards, but you wouldn't have a lot of damage on board. You'd just be attacking for 500 and then 500 and then 500. That takes a long time to kill an opponent, especially if your opponent flips Wall of Disruption and now your guys are at zero attack points. And until you draw a Silent Magician, there's not a lot of ways to actually out it. So if if you don't draw a Silent Magician or you can't stack it with Spellbook Organization, a lot of times it's actually pretty hard to kill your opponent and that definitely sucked. There's not a huge way around that. You could play the Strength of Prophecy card, but I didn't like that because it's pretty bad turn one and only get in those situations where you couldn't draw a Silent Magician. Other than that, I think the biggest problem with this deck is the, um, the addition of Cosmocyclone and Hey Trunade in a lot of your opponent's lists. Both those cards are really good against your deck. I think in general, one way you can play around Cosmic Cyclone at least is when you add Spellbook of Organization, when you do your normal combo, you actually just set it next to the Fate and then when your opponent summons something or when they activate Cosmic Cyclone targeting um, the Spellbook of Organization, you can just chain it and then that puts three cards in your grave for Fate and then you can flip the Fate up. It's pretty darn good. So you can save that organization until your opponent actually does something. You don't have to do it on your own turn. One cool thing with Spellbook Organization as well is that if you add it with Pop, Power in the end phase, or I guess it's not, it's not technically the end phase, but there's no main phase two in this game, so it's a little tricky. But if you add it with power, you can use it in the um, battle phase still to get a third spellbook in your graveyard. That came up a lot as well. But just in general, Cosmic Cyclone, easy to play around in general. Hey Trunade, almost impossible to play around. Um, I think I got Hey Trunade about six times, and only one of those I actually lost just because you can still fate to set Blue Boy face down, hopefully block some damage, and then you get a search. Usually you're fine sometimes they will just kill you there's no way to play around that though as for possible changes that you can make to my list that I showed earlier and that I'll show right now, I think adding Cosmic Cyclone is hugely advantageous to your strategy. It combos really well with Switcheroo. I did not have one. Actually, as soon as we got King of Games, I pulled one out of the very first pack that I bought with the 200 gems that they gave you. So that was pretty funny. I definitely would have played that card. It would help a lot with enemy controller as well. You don't have to always draw a Silent Magician. You can simply just activate Cosmic Cyclone and take care of it. Spellbook Library of Crescent is another starter card that you can play. It's a little risky and ultimately I decided not to play it because uh, the boost, the slight boost in consistency to me wasn't worth sort of hindering the late game, which I felt spellbooks were really good in. Um, so I didn't play Crescent, but it is an interesting card that you can play. It's good when you open it by yourself or if you open Blue Boy and don't have to seek it to the Blue Boy, you can use Crescent and then it kind of works in the same way that spellbook organization works where it puts another spellbook in your graveyard. Also, I did not play Wall of Disruption. I don't know if that card actually is good in this deck. I'm not sure looking back on it if I would have played it, but if you want a defensive option against for hires and maybe stop all of their OTKs, which definitely happen a lot, Wall of D could be a useful card, but I just didn't have the time to actually grind out gems to open all those packs. Anyway, what were my struggles with Duel Links? Well, one of the things that I found super annoying was that uh, the game doesn't tell you what the dual skills do unless they're doing something immediately. But a lot of the time my opponent would activate a dual skill and I simply had no idea what it was doing. And I, had, I found myself often having to Google what dual skills were to play around with what my opponent was doing. Konami really should just add in a thing where you can click the dual skill that just was activated. You actually read what it does. Also, one of the most <laughs> annoying things when I was trying to play Play all these games in a row is that the ladder system doesn't show you how many wins you need to rank up until you're one win away and they also don't tell you how many um, losses you need to take before you
you rank down until you're one loss away. This doesn't make any sense to me, especially as someone that's played a lot of Hearthstone, where in Hearthstone, every win you get is a star. Every time you lose, you lose a star. You know exactly what's happening. Also, one of the most infuriating things about the Dual Links ladder system happens when you fall out of Legend 3. Now, in Hearthstone, let's say you fall out of rank 1, you don't have to start at the bottom of rank 2 again, you just are one win away from getting back into rank 1. But in this game, losing at Legend 3, which I did after I went from like a 3 win streak, uh, 2 wins away from King of Games, to losing 3 in a row, one of them due to a disconnect, we'll talk about it in a second, but I had to then win 5 straight games just to get back into Legend 2, and that's what I did, but there certainly was a situation that could potentially have happened where I got knocked out into Legend 2, and then it took me hours to get back into Legend 3. There's no reason that you should have to restart Legend 2 as soon as you get knocked out of Legend 3. That's that just makes no sense to me. And then what I just mentioned in my, so my last gripe with Duel Links is the disconnection. So I had three disconnects, two of which ruined a streak to King of Games. There were situations where the stream did not di get disconnected. It wasn't an actual internet disconnect. I don't know what happened. Once again, I'll bring up Hearthstone. If you get disconnected in Hearthstone, you can actually just join back in. Yeah, the game still continues, the timer still continues, but you can join back in as long as the game is still going on. That's what Duel Links should do. I don't know why that system is in place where if you get disconnected for like half a second, it just quits you from the match. But that was definitely one of the craziest uh, things that happened to me on my climb to King of Games was just getting disconnected three times. Um, two of them were right in a row, knocking me out of my streak, which was just insane. And definitely two of the, or three of the times, I guess, where I really went on tilt, where most of the times when I lost, I was like, okay, that makes sense. But those disconnects, man, those hurt the most. I'm sure there are things that I forgot to say but I think it's about time that I wrap this up because this video is way too long already. I do want to say that even though I started playing Duel Links again just because it was a meme, just because I wanted to play something on stream instead of Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro, even though that's why I started playing, I actually found the game to be a lot more fun than I initially thought. Even in that stale meta, it actually was really fun to sort of pick a rogue strategy. I know some people, some Duel Links players were saying um, spellbooks aren't rogue, but honestly, in the all the hours that I played. I only played against a couple mirror matches and none of them are playing my version. So I think it's actually pretty safe to say that spell books in some ways are kind of like the alter guys of um, the Duel Links meta. But I think that even though that's, the meta was super stale, it was fun to play a rogue strategy. And uh, to describe for hires in the uh, context of Duel Links, it's basically like playing against Goki every single round and going second if hand traps didn't exist. And that certainly makes that matchup almost impossible. But the reason that Goki keys are sort of kept in check by other strategies, even though they are one of the best decks out there right now, is simply because there are actually ways to combat those boards. But in Duel Links, because of the limited card pool, there aren't a lot of ways to actually be a fair hire deck if you're going second, unless you yourself are playing for hires. I also think it was really cool to be challenged. Um, I really liked um, the limited card pool and the new rules. I liked the skills that I had to play around. I liked the, um, the playing around just having three monster zones. All these different rule changes, all the different card pool changes actually made the game pretty interesting from the perspective of someone that came from the TCG. I will say, in general, a lot of the people on the Duel Links ladder didn't know all their rulings. There were certain cases where my opponent would just do things that seemed really weird in context, but I think that they thought the ruling worked a different way. I would say that because Duel Links is completely online and you don't actually have to know any rulings to play, that's probably why that happened more than it happens in real life, where you have to actually manually do stuff. As far as the changes that I don't like about Duel Links, I think the biggest one isn't actually the extra deck now that I've played this game a lot. I think the biggest thing that I dislike is that there's no main phase 2. I understand why they do that, but it definitely sucks. I think the, the time that I notice it the most is when I want um, to uh, set a Spellbook of Fate, obviously, for my opponent's turn, but then I want to keep it in my hand just in case they activate something in the battle phase. This came up the most often with Amazonus Onslaught, and in a lot of cases, I would have to position myself, hopefully, to not only have a Fate that I can set, but also one that I can keep in hand, but sometimes I simply could not do that, and it actually made it pretty hard. I will say, Duel Links is absolutely not 
old school Yu-Gi-Oh. I think it's more like a cube if you've ever drafted a cube. I think it's more like battle pack with archetypes, but it's definitely not old school Yu-Gi-Oh. Nothing really like that. It's, it's a lot faster and a lot more combo intensive than old school Yu-Gi-Oh. I don't know how much more of Duel Links I'll play going forward. I don't know if I'll buy a new deck anytime soon, but it was a fun way to kill a couple days playing a Yu-Gi-Oh format that I've never experienced before. And I'm really happy that I was able to, as a TCG player, actually make it to King of Games, which is the highest rank because this was my first season really ever playing the Duel Links competitive ladder. Anyway, Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. I'm sorry it was so long. I just want to talk about so many things and I probably missed some things. I do want to give one final thank you to all the people that were came in, coming out to the streams, the hundreds of you. We, we averaged like four to 500 viewers for every single stream that we did of Duel Links. You guys were extremely helpful helping me deal with different skills, helping me um, figure out what decks my opponents were playing, what combos they were trying to do because I couldn't have done that without you guys and I really appreciate it. But I will see you guys later. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.